Welcome to POTUS 2017, where we keep watch on the Oval Office and pour cold hard facts on the overheated political rhetoric. I'm Brian Lehrer. Today, let's set aside the Russia investigations. They distract from other important matters and not just the Senate's quiet attempt to rush through a health care bill without hearings. Instead, let's look closely at one particular moment of silence that's been lost in all the noise. Turns out the White House has chosen not to acknowledge that June is LGBTQ Pride Month. This is more than symbolic. It reflects serious policy changes and breaks a presidential tradition. Eight years ago, Barack Obama declared that each June would be LGBT Pride Month. Trump has removed the page on the LGBTQ rights from the White House website and reversed the Obama-era protections that gave transgender students the federal right to use bathrooms matching their gender identity. It's left to the states now. Are these shifts in White House policy surprising? Yes and no. On his path to the presidency, Donald Trump was no model of tolerance, but he did stand apart from social conservatives, saying he was fine with the Supreme Court's gay marriage ruling, said he would allow Caitlyn Jenner to use the women's restroom at Trump Tower, and after Orlando, he defended the LGBTQ community, albeit couched in terms of terrorism. This time, the terrorists targeted LGBTQ community. No good. And we're going to stop it. As your president, I will do everything in my power to protect our LGBTQ citizens from the violence and oppression of a hateful foreign ideology. Believe me. Okay, so it seems like he's still memorizing the sequence of letters. But how is the LGBTQ community doing in the ever-changing era of Trump? We'll discuss that in just a moment. And later in our evidence-based politics segment, hear from a scholar who says the Internet is making civil wars more numerous, bloodier, and longer. First, LGBTQ rights. Last year, 2016, was the deadliest year for LGBTQ Americans in the 20 years of record keeping, according to a new report. Even apart from the Pulse nightclub massacre, where 49 were killed last June, LGBTQ hate violence deaths rose 17 percent from 2015. Other studies indicate that bullying of gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender students persists. To give us the overview, joining us, BuzzFeed's national correspondent, Dominic Holden. He won the 2016 Excellence in Journalism Award from the National Association of LGBTQ Journalists. With some cold, hard facts, Emily Waters, Senior Manager of National Research and Policy at the New York City Anti-Violence Project. And on the efforts to combat school bullying via Skype from Washington, D.C., Nathan Smith, Director of Public Policy at GLSEN, a group specializing in LGBT student safety. Welcome to all of you. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Emily, let me start with you. The transgender community was a big part of your study, mm -hmm. finding 2016 was the deadliest for LGBT Americans in 20 years of reporting, especially with the Orlando shooting. Mm -hmm. So of LGBT homicides, not even including the Orlando shooting, there were 28 victims last year. And here's the part I want to ask you about first. 68% of those victims, or 19 people, mm -hmm. were transgender or non-conforming. And 61%, or 17 people, were transgender women of color. Mm -hmm. Is this the norm over the years? And why is that small group such a particular target? Yeah, so there's a, a couple of important things to consider here when we're talking about the um, recent rise in reports of homicides of transgender women of color. So what we've seen over the course of the last few years is that these numbers are definitely rising and that trend is continuing into 2017. So we've already actually had 12 um, within 2017. Um, and we get asked this question a lot of whether or not this actually means that those numbers are, are going up, if there are, are actually more homicides of transgender women of color, or if folks are just getting better at reporting on it. Um, we don't exactly know if these numbers are going up because 
um, it's really difficult to know how many homicides are actually happening of LGBTQ people in general, but particularly of transgender people, um, because their identities so often get erased by police and within the media. Um, and what we have seen over the course of the last couple of years is that advocates and community members and um, people within the trans community have really taken it upon themselves to hold media accountable, to hold police accountable, and to ensure that these um, that the proper um, pronouns and names and things are being used within the media so that, um, you know, that people can be honored in their deaths and so that we can b better understand what's happening. With that being said, we do hear consistently from the transgender community like that they do feel like that there is an increase in violence happening um, and that they are very fearful of that happening and particularly for trans women of color who are experiencing this very unique kind of intersection of bias, right, of anti-trans bias, of um, anti-women bias and also racism happening. So all three of those things are converging that are placing um, that community at higher risk. Nathan, let me turn to you and schools. Tell us about the latest National School Climate Survey, particularly as it relates to bullying of LGBTQ students. We have found over the years that school climate has gradually gotten better for LGBT students, but very slowly. Um, and what we're finding in our most recent survey is that LGBT students um, still report uh, victimization at particularly high rates. Um, are particularly likely to hear anti-LGBT remarks in schools, uh, are particularly likely to report verbal or physical harassment, uh, or worse, verbal or physical assault in schools, um, and often don't feel safe. Dominic, as a national reporter, what's really changing in terms of policy from the Obama administration to the Trump administration in this area? For sure, we are not seeing the same type of administration. And that is not surprising, given this is a Republican administration and Obama was a Democrat. Um, clearly, Trump has not made LGBT issues a big priority. Some people uh, were hoping that he would. Some people were worried that he would. Um, he's surrounded himself with appointments and people on upper level staff who hold some pretty strong anti-LGBT views. And during the campaign, of course, he had uh, vowed to sign anti-LGBT legislation. He'd suggested that he would repeal uh, certain executive orders from Obama. Um, now that he's in office, uh, one of the things he did early on is he said he wouldn't repeal a non-discrimination order that Obama had signed protecting LGBT workers and federal contractors. Religious conservatives were very upset about that. At the same time, uh, progressives have been concerned. Um, they've been alarmed that they have not seen, for instance, these normal gestures now, uh, like a designating a Pride Month, uh, having an LGBT liaison, um, not tracking LGBT youth and people. The biggest thing, though, by far, and you mentioned this at the beginning, is that the Trump administration, through Jeff Sessions and Betsy DeVos at the Department of Education, rescinded the guidance that protected transgender students, saying that they can use facilities that match their gender identity. And the question is, behind all of that, is how is this administration going to interpret existing civil rights laws? Mm -hmm. Is this an indication, not only that they're saying, well, you aren't protected necessarily, that they're going to explicitly say you are not protected, and they're going to carry that through? So to that point, I want to put up a chart from your study, Nathan, and have you um, interpret this for the viewers so we see frequency of victimization based on gender expression over time. This is among students. And the timeline starts at 2001 on the left hand of the chart and goes to 2015. We'll deal with 2016 separately. Uh, the red line at the top is verbal harassment. The gray line in the middle is physical harassment. And the green line at the bottom is physical assault. It looks like it went up, each of these things, through the last years of the Bush administration and declined through the entire eight years of the Obama administration. How else should we read this? I think that that's right. And I think that one thing that in particular that this shows is that when you have an administration that prioritizes policy that protects students uh, based on their gender identity and gender expression, uh, things get better in schools. Um, as Dominic mentioned, the Trump administration's rescission of the Title IX guidance um, sends a mixed messages both to students in schools, which I think 
Um, we'll see how that reflects in future iterations of the school climate survey, but also sends a mixed message to educators and the policymakers on the district level of how they should be enforcing uh, Title IX to protect transgender and gender nonconforming students in their districts. And so, Emily, this is maybe where your report tacks on to his report, mm -hmm. 2016. Yeah. Yeah. So um, it's interesting listening to Dominic talk about the impact of not only the rescinding of the um, Title IX guidance, but kind of looking at overall civil rights protections. Um, and I think one thing that is often surprising to people is that there is only one law that's been passed by Congress that includes specific non-discrimination provisions for LGBTQ people, and that's the Violence Against Women Act. Um, every other protection that exists on the federal level comes through things like guidances and regulations and rules um, and executive orders. And those are the things that folks are really worried about right now, um, particularly the regulations that were put in place under the Obama administration that provide protections in housing, that provide pr protections um, in employment in these other areas. And in our report, that's where we found that um, the majority of LGBTQ survivors of violence are reporting experiencing violence in these areas, right? So these areas are already the places that are the least safe. Um, and these are the exact places where advocates are worried that the Trump administration will be rolling back protections. So is this a matter for Jeff Sessions, Dominic, and the Justice Department? I mean, he's supposed to be a law and order attorney general. We're talking about acts of harassment and in many cases acts of violence. Right. So I don't think many people are expecting Congress to take big affirmative uh, steps toward LGBT rights. So a lot of these legal questions and enforcement actions are left up to Jeff Sessions and the Justice Department. So we have these outstanding questions. Uh, we have an LGBT hate crimes law, the Shepard Byrd Act. Is this Justice Department under Trump actually going to pursue those crimes and assist local law enforcement? And are they going to continue down the path of the previous administration and many courts to say that bans on sex discrimination, whether it be in housing regulations or whether it be in schools or workplaces, encompass gender identity discrimination and therefore protect trans people or if they take a, a you know, hard opposite tack and say, no, they don't. Jeff Sessions and the Justice Department have a lot of power here, and it doesn't look like Trump is focusing on this issue, so Sessions may have the leeway to do it. Mm -hmm. I wonder if we should take just a second here to raise people's consciousness who are not fully familiar with the lettering. Trump had his own problems with it, reading the teleprompter there. So LGBTQ, people know L for lesbian, G for gay, gay men, bi, okay, people know what that is, trans. For those who really are kind of confused about it, who wants to do it? Emily, do you? What's the Q? So Q stands for queer. Um, and there's a couple different ways to think about queer. So queer can be thought of as an umbrella term that represents um, the various different communities within the LGBTQ community. Um, it's also a very specific identity that people hold. So some people identify as being queer. Um, and it tends to be a little bit more political in nature. Um, it tends to have a little bit more political roots saying that like I do not necessarily want to identify with um, you know, these kind of distinct categories, but recognize that there are many different sexual orientations and gender identities within that. Um, and we often recognize, you know, people have some issues with the word queer. It used to be word, it used to be used obviously as a slur against the um, LGBTQ or queer community. Um, but many people have taken that back as, you know, a word that they now want to use as an empowering word for themselves. And I'm sure Trump understood all of that. I'm <laughs> sure, yes. Nathan, any? Anything to add? I would, I would just add that for Glisten's purpose, um, we definitely use the Q as queer. We also sort of double use it. We also use it for questioning. Um, a lot of the students who respond to our surveys may not be uh, settled in their sexual orientation, may still be, uh, that may be evolving, and for even some adults, that evolves over the course of their lives. And so um, as students begin to uh, question their sexual orientation, we think that it's important to affirm that as well. And so we want to make sure that we include that. So Nathan, forget politics for a minute. To the work of your group, how do you prevent bullying, reduce bullying at the grassroots? There's several things that can be done. Uh, one is that educators have a real role to play in intervening uh, when they hear or witness instances of bullying. 
um, and also to provide safe spaces in their classrooms for LGBTQ students uh, to have a place where they can go and feel safe and know that that educator is supportive. Uh, another is that folks in schools can support the formation of GSAs, uh, which are Gay Straight Alliances or Gender and Sexuality Alliances, uh, which are student clubs that can uh, be used really for whatever that student uh, group wants to do, whether that's public education within the school community, um, whether that's putting on various events, um, but really providing a safe space for them to be. Uh, and then, of course, uh, I know you said forget politics, but there's such an important role to play uh, for folks on uh, the local level across the country to engage with their school boards and their state legislatures um, to speak up in support of LGBTQ students. And we just have 30 seconds left. Dominic, what are you tracking in terms of bathroom bills? Is this now a state-by-state -state matter? Absolutely. The war is really in these state legislatures. It's between social conservatives and oftentimes businesses that don't believe that discrimination like that is good for the economy of the state, and they've been the ones pushing back as hard as the LGBT activists. Thank you all very much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And now let's bring on some additional evidence. Time for evidence-based politics, where we pour cold hard facts on the overheated political rhetoric. Civil wars across the globe are on the rise. After dropping to about 30 in 2003, the number had climbed back up to near 40 in 2015. Many factors contribute to these civil conflicts, from Syria to Chad, but says UC San Diego political science professor Barbara Walter, the Internet has made them bloodier, longer, more international, and could promote more wars in the future. Ms. Walter's recent paper about the impact of the Internet on civil war can be found in this year's annual review of political science. Lots for the new commander-in-chief to learn and deal with. Welcome, Ms. Walter. Professor Walter, welcome to the program. Thank you very much. Um, I guess there's good and bad in your study, not just bad. Uh, you found that with modern technology and information uh, technology especially, it's easier to organize protests in authoritarian regimes and harder mm -hmm. for the authoritarians to stop them. Can you talk about that first? Yeah, so the benefit that authoritarian regimes had in the past is that they had a lock on information. They could control what information their citizens got, they could control what was disseminated. And the internet, and especially the web 2.0 world of user-generated material, has really changed that. Now, individual citizens have the ability to essentially disseminate information from remote places, from their homes. They can connect with people um, outside of their countries. And it's much harder for governments to control this information. And we know that who controls the information and es essentially uh, gains power. So in essence, it's disseminated power somewhat down to the individual level. Although other sources, uh, you know, other groups that do studies uh, and follow world affairs seem to track that the number of authoritarian regimes in the world is actually rising over the last 10 or 15 years, not falling as we might expect mm -hmm. from that fact. Yes. So one of the interesting things is we have seen um, increasing democratization um, pretty consistently over time, especially since the end of World War II. But what we do know is that it's very rare for governments to go from very authoritarian to very democratic. They almost all go through this period of transition when they're sort of pseudo-democracies and pseudo-autocracies. And what we know is that many regimes get stuck in that in-between phase. And in fact, some of them often backslide. So what you're seeing in Russia today with Putin, for example, is a perfect example of that. A government that did appear on the road to becoming a mature democracy, getting stuck, and now sliding backwards towards authoritarianism. And um, those are the times when there's uncertainty and stability, 
where information becomes particularly important. So you also found that the internet is likely to make civil wars longer, bloodier, and more international. Let's take each of these. Um, the internet is not a gun or a bomb or a grenade. How would it make a civil war bloodier? So there's two things that rebel, I'm going to call them rebel entrepreneurs, those individuals who would like to mobilize a rebel faction to fight a government. There's two things that they need. They need soldiers to help fight the war, and they need financing to help supply those soldiers. And it used to be that those entrepreneurs who had strong local support within a country had the ability to recruit soldiers and gain financing. The internet has blown that open. Now, if you have access to the internet, you can begin to recruit internationally. So even if you're not popular within a particular community or a particular state even, you can begin to produce propaganda that will attract individuals from all over the globe. And the same is true of financing. So if you're a Sunni group and you embrace, um, for example, Salafi jihadism, that suddenly becomes attractive to the wealthy Gulf oil states who are Sunni and who support that ideology to a certain extent. So the internet suddenly allows you to, to attempt to gain um, the two things that you need to mobilize a fighting faction um, internationally rather than relying on a local base of support. So international nature of the rebellions um, makes them longer and bloodier just because there's more money flowing in to many of these countries' rebel groups? There's more consistent funding. So uh, there's simply more donors from which you can solicit money, and that tends to allow uh, you to continue the war longer. But another fact factor is important in, in, I believe, lengthening the duration of these wars. We know from research on civil wars that the greater the number of fighting factions in any given civil war, the longer that civil war tends to last. And if it becomes easier for political entrepreneurs to mobilize forces, and they don't need local support, that means a greater number of fighting factions will, will form, and more factions means longer wars. Is that what we're seeing in Syria? where there are multiple factions fighting against the Assad regime, and the U.S., for example, has trouble figuring out who are the friendly rebel groups and who are the hostile rebel groups, even if they're all against Assad. Yes. So one of the unique features of this new wave of civil wars is how many factions are fighting, and Syria is the perfect example. There's multiple major armed factions and then there's hundreds of smaller factions. And this is both on the opposition side, the rebel side, and on the government side. There are multiple pro-government militias um, that are fighting alongside the Assad regime. So we've seen this proliferation of small fighting factions in a way we really haven't seen um, in any significant way in the past. And the proliferation of websites contributes to the proliferation of groups. What do you see as the implications for the United States in this as a country that, you know, was for a long time after 1989 and the fall of communism the sole superpower in the world, but uh, both under Obama for his reasons and under Trump for his different reasons, want to retreat to the extent possible? These are really complicated wars with multiple players and multiple shifting factions and alliances, and it's very difficult to know who to support. And because, for example, the opposition, the rebel groups in Syria have not united, that they are in essence in competition with each other, in addition to competition with uh, the Assad regime, it's very difficult to know who to support. And then to control where that material and that money uh, ends up going to. And one of the fears of the United States has been that money will simply be funneled into the hands of radical extremists who ultimately um, have uh, aims at the United States as well. Do you think that people's initial view of the internet was too idealistic 
People certainly talked in the 90s and early 2000s about the democratization of information and how with more people being connected, it would be harder for authoritarian regimes to rule. It would be harder for elites to control all the information flow, any kind of elites. Uh, now you're talking about the internet contributing to longer, bloodier, more factionalized, and more international civil wars. This is hardly, you know, information wants to be free. Yes. So I think any time you have a major technological change, and, and the internet was a technological revolution, I think the, the immediate inclination is to see the positive and also to be unaware of all the implications. These are really, really complex changes. And I think like any complex change, it's almost impossible to anticipate all the ways it's going to affect not just individual lives, but the lives of groups and populations and states and state leaders, and even you know, on a global level. And I think what we're seeing is sort of the natural progression of our understanding of a new technology, where only by seeing it evolve do we begin to understand um, all the ways that it could potentially be exploited, both for good and for bad. I, I don't want to oversimplify uh, the downsides of the web either. It's still, uh, I mean, people have to have their grievances in order to start and to yes. continue to fight civil wars. So those, I would think you'd agree, are the underlying factors still at root. But in our last 30 seconds, um, do you call for anything, any kind of regulation of the international web? Or is that um, A, wrong, and B, impossible? Well, there's already, there's already regulations and control. So one of the things that we know about ISIS, for example, is that it's very, very savvy in terms of how it uses the internet. It produces more internet propaganda than any other rebel group that has ever existed. Uh, and so one of the things that uh, companies like Twitter and Facebook are doing are uh, trying to keep on top of that. The problem is that ISIS doesn't need to use Twitter to disseminate its message. Um, there are multiple different ways to do it, and it's a very sophisticated operation. Huh. And at this point, um, we, it's, it's Im almost imp it's impossible to keep on top of all of the different ways that they can make themselves heard. Professor Walter, thank you very much. It's my pleasure. And that's POTUS 2017 for today. We're here each week at this hour pouring cold hard facts on the overheated political rhetoric. I'm Brian Lehrer. Thanks for watching.